My name is Phil Walls. I'm Chief Clinical Officer for MyMatrix. Thank you for joining this edition of Comp Talks. The subject today, Risky Business, the journey of fentanyl from licit to illicit drug. Now, fentanyl, I know, is a, a drug name that many of you are already familiar with. But what we want to discuss today is how did this drug that is so widely used for pain management as a prescription drug become an illegal drug? Because this journey is much more different than that of some of the other opioids. With some of the other opioids, what we saw hit the street was the, the brand name drug itself. It was simply being diverted into the black market. Fentanyl, although that can happen, more than likely we're seeing an actual illegally manufactured form of fentanyl when it comes to the, the street use. So how did that happen? And, and what is fentanyl? Well, it is an opioid, known as a synthetic opioid, that is 50 times more potent than heroin, 100 times more potent than morphine. Well, where did it come from? Um, I use the term synthetic opioid. So let's talk about that for a moment, because it's very important to, to understand the differences here. Uh, a natural opioid is a drug like morphine that is derived from the opium poppy. In fact, morphine was the first drug ever to be successfully isolated from a plant source, and that happened in the late 19th century. Next, there are semi-synthetic opioids, which means that you still have to start with the poppy, uh, produce morphine, and then modify it into something else. That's where hydrocodone came from, uh, and drugs like Vicodin, Lortab, etc. And this also uh, describes heroin. Heroin is a semi-synthetic opioid which means that for the illegal manufacture of heroin, the individual still has to start with the opium poppy. Then we have synthetic opioids, which synthetic in this case means entirely man-made. Um, it can be produced without need, the need of the opium poppy. Um, we take chemicals, we, we modify those, and we're able to produce uh, fentanyl. In fact, one person in a lab can produce fentanyl. Or, as our story goes today, one person in a basement. And I'll explain what I mean by that in just a few moments. So fentanyl itself was first discovered by Dr. Paul Janssen in 1960. Dr. Janssen went on to uh, form Janssen Pharmaceuticals. Um, when he was working on fentanyl, this was a very different era than what we saw with uh, everything that went wrong with opioids in the 1990s. Uh, his motivation was, was very clinically Inclined. He was looking for an opioid that could be used in anesthesia to avoid some of the side effects caused by other anesthetic agents. Um, so he was looking for something that would go to work quickly, get out of the body quickly so it didn't leave that lingering effect, and also cause less nausea and vomiting. So by, by changing the, the chemical structure and then actually developing a, a new chemical that acted as an opioid, he developed fentanyl which was extremely fast acting. Uh, it went to work quickly, it cleared out of the body quickly, and it caused much less nausea and vomiting. And he brought that drug to market under the brand name Sublimase, which was a, a very powerful anesthetic. Um, and that was the, the primary uh, drug produced by Janssen Pharmaceuticals for a number of years. Um, eventually they decided though, you know, there's good properties of fentanyl that could be useful in other areas of pain management. So the question was, what if they could make fentanyl into a long-acting form, uh, still have the properties of less nausea and vomiting, and what they came up with was the duragesic patch. They found that fentanyl could be absorbed through the skin. It wasn't easy, but it could happen. So the, the technology that went into the creation of this patch, which has been widely used since then, uh, allowed for the slow absorption of fentanyl over up to a 72-hour period. So for a, a, a patient in pain, moderate to severe pain, uh, preferably cancer patients, it was a very suitable drug. Now, Actique was developed by another company, Cephalon. Uh, Cephalon, again, was looking on the favorable properties of fentanyl, goes to work quickly, and decided that the, the market there would be end-of-life cancer patients that were experiencing extreme pain. Now, end-of-life cancer patients, the preference for those patients is not to be institutionalized at that time. They want to be at home. The problem, though, with a homebound patient is that the caregiver is more than likely going to be the spouse or another family member that is not qualified by any means to administer something, especially as dangerous as morphine. So Cephalon 
came up with the, the realization that since fentanyl can be absorbed through the, the lining of the mouth so easily and go to work so quickly, it was almost as good as giving a, a cancer patient an injection of another opioid like morphine. So the, the Actique lollipop came to the market, uh, never intended for anything outside of end-of-life pain, but it's not these prescription forms that, that I'm concerned with in our discussion today. Uh, let's move on now to how it became an illicit drug. Um, there was a, a, a young man, uh, a teenager. He was a self-described genius. He was also a high school dropout uh, by the name of George Marquine. Now, he lived with his parents, and in his parents' basement, he first successfully as a teenager was able to produce heroin. Now, as I said, heroin, being a, a semi-synthetic product, means at some point you have to have access to the opium poppy. Well, George, being the uh, enterprising young man that he was, he, he realized that he could start with raw ingredients without the need of the opium poppy or with access to morphine and produce fentanyl. And that's exactly what he did. So a single person in his parents' basement was able to produce fentanyl. Now, George Marquardt was arrested in 1993. But by this time, the damage had already been done. Fentanyl was hitting the street as an illegal drug. In fact, it was becoming a substitute for heroin. And the reasons for that? Well, one, as I mentioned, it's very potent. It's 50 times more potent than heroin. That means to, a, to an illegal drug dealer, you need a lot less product and have the same market distribution than you would with something like heroin. Uh, it's also easier to produce and cheaper to produce. You're not reliant on importing uh, opium poppies from, from other countries, uh, such as uh, the, the uh, Middle East. Um, you're able to simply, if you can obtain the necessary chemicals, you can produce it in a basement laboratory. Now, we saw fentanyl first in the United States as a substitute for heroin on the East Coast. Uh, the reason for this being simply that in those days, the worldwide distribution of uh, illegal opioids, um, the heroin that was coming into the, the East Coast of the United States, coming in through Europe, particularly France, uh, was a, a more pure form. It was a crystalline powder. Whereas the heroin that was entering the United States through Mexico was a much cruder form. It was a, a black, tarry mass. Now, fentanyl, produced in the way I've described, is a white crystalline powder easily substitutable for the heroin that was in use uh, on the eastern uh, side of the United States. Everything west of the Mississippi, it was a much slower process, although it's, it's a concern now throughout the United States, but that was sort of, as I said, part of, part of this journey. Um, around 2013, we started seeing a significant increase in overdose deaths that were related to synthetic opioids, in particular fentanyl. Uh, around the same time period, 2013 to 2014, we saw a 400% increase in the seizure of illegal fentanyl. Uh, so as I said, even though George Marquardt was arrested in 1993, the damage was done, fentanyl had found its place in, in drug abuse as a substitute for heroin. Um, in fact, today, many of the overdose deaths attributed to heroin are indeed caused by fentanyl. Today, we know of at least 42 different illegal analogs of fentanyl. Now, an analog, that is simply a, another term for uh, deriving a drug by modifying the original drug chemically. Uh, so, so not unlike the, the uh, story behind heroin, fentanyl was also changed, looking for ways to make it more potent, and it worked. In fact, uh, the, the most potent drug that I know of in this regard is known as carfentanil. Uh, you'll see carfentanil in the newspaper headlines as the elephant tranquilizer. And indeed, that's what it is. Uh, like fentanyl, carfentanil is also considered a legal drug because it has a prescription use as a veterinary anesthetic. Uh, it is used to tranquilize elephants. On the street, it is 100 times more potent than fentanyl. Remember, fentanyl is 100 times more potent than morphine. That means carfentanil, do the math, 10,000 times as strong as morphine. It takes a grain of this to change from uh, an intended dose to an overdose. Uh, the danger, the risk there is significant, which takes us to the second half of our discussion today.
risk of these drugs, fentanyl and its analogs, to first responders. Uh, again, this is something that you're going to see uh, in the headlines. I also want to take a moment to thank uh, Dr. Adam Seidner at uh, the Hartford. Uh, he and I have had some serious discussions on this, and a lot of the information that I'm providing today uh, came from Dr. Seidner. Um, when we look at uh, this from a risk management perspective, there are several things to consider. Uh, certainly, first and foremost, uh, the risk to the first responders. In the newspapers, there has been a debate about whether or not a uh, police officer, uh, paramedic, whomever it happens to be, can they indeed suffer an overdose through casual skin contact? Uh, my purpose today is not to debate that subject. It doesn't matter. These individuals are being exposed to a very dangerous drug. Whether it can be absorbed through the skin or not, it can be ingested, it can be inhaled, and it is causing overdoses and overdose deaths among these individuals. Um, so we're going to focus on the risk that it causes. First of all, the first responders need to, the appropriate personal protective equipment. Uh, they need nitrile gloves, they need uh, face masks, um, anything that's going to protect them from the accidental inhalation or ingestion uh, of fentanyl. Uh, the best advice for these individuals, and, and they all know this, um, if in doubt, if there's a white powder present, assume it's fentanyl. Uh, fentanyl is so dangerous, there are no uh, on-scene uh, tests performed. It should also be handled, uh, it should be isolated as soon as possible. Those tests need to be carried out by a laboratory with the appropriate uh, uh, setup to handle a dangerous drug like this. In terms of uh, uh, the scene itself, if they arrive, if they see any type of drug paraphernalia, uh, anything indicating a drug overdose, uh, until proven otherwise, assume fentanyl is involved. It's just that serious. Now, in terms of the patient at the scene, uh, the person that has undergone the overdose, let's talk for a moment about what uh, you as an individual could recognize that would indicate an opioid overdose. First of all, there's going to be uh, possibly no breathing uh, from this individual or shallow breathing at best. Um, more than likely, their lips, their nail beds are going to be blue from lack of oxygen. Uh, you're not going to see movement from the person, uh, other than the possibility of some slight choking sensations. Uh, you're not going to hear anything other than the possibility of uh, some gurgling sounds as they do attempt to, uh, to breathe or are unable to do so. Um, in the case of an opioid overdose, the only uh, antidote is naloxone. Now, many of you have heard me talk about naloxone before. The important thing to remember today is going back to how much more fentanyl and its analogs, how much more potent than they are than traditional opioids. What that means is one dose of naloxone may not be enough in these situations. So be prepared to administer a second or even more doses. This is perfectly safe and acceptable in the case of a, a, an opioid overdose. In fact, naloxone has very little effect in the absence of an opioid. Um, so there's, there's very little danger in that. There are, however, concerns. Um, if you're not a first responder, if you're an individual on the scene uh, who's been able to assess the situation, call 911, even if you have access to naloxone. Why? Well, naloxone is going to, to save that person's life in the case of an opioid overdose. However, you're still going to be in an emergent situation. Why? You've saved their life, but by administering naloxone, you've brought them out of an opioid overdose and immediately put them into withdrawal from an opioid. Many individuals in that situation, they come out of the overdose, they immediately go into withdrawal, they, they come back to consciousness in a very combative state and have even been known to hurt the person that has just saved their life. So that's why I'm saying you need 911 on the scene as soon as possible. I hope this information has been helpful to you. I have enjoyed today's talk and uh, thank you very much.